This is the CBS Evening News. Dan Rather reporting. Good evening. The retreat of Soviet military power from Afghanistan is complete. The last of Russia's regular army invasion force is out. Fear and uncertainty were mixed with joy today as the commander of Soviet troops followed the last of his men across the border, leaving the communist Afghan regime alone to face victorious resistance fighters. CBS News Moscow correspondent Barry Peterson begins our coverage. Almost a decade of Soviet bloodshed and battle ended five minutes ahead of schedule as the Soviet army completed its retreat. The last combat soldier to leave, Commanding General Boris Gromov. He walked across the Friendship Bridge into the arms of his 15-year-old son. There was hoopla and ceremony at the border and blunt criticism in the Communist Party newspaper Pravda for ever getting involved. Meanwhile, the Soviet-trained and equipped Afghan army is apparently falling apart, plagued by desertions and reports that troops looted and then abandoned former Soviet outposts. It was quiet in Kabul, despite reports of 30,000 guerrillas massing to take the city. The city is open, the people come to the air shops. As chronic shortages continue, the Soviets called for an immediate ceasefire and offered to stop shipping weapons to the government if the U.S. will stop supplying the Mujahideen guerrillas. It's a deal the Americans have refused before. Many Soviets believe the city will fall, and with it, the Marxist government. But as the Soviet commander said today, I'm not looking back. Barry Peterson, CBS News, Moscow. According to the latest intelligence reports, there are still several hundred Soviet military personnel inside Afghanistan, left behind to protect Soviet civilians. But U.S. officials view that as a technicality. The Soviets have said their long goodbye and done what was once all but inconceivable. I think at the time of the Soviet invasion, there was this general assumption that once the Soviet invade a country, uh, they cannot be defeated, they cannot be forced out. The ferocity and skill of the Mujahideen combined with the rise of Mikhail Gorbachev to produce a watershed event. The Soviets lost on the battlefield, and Gorbachev saw that they were losing, saw that the war was unwinnable, and then, as a... Uh, as sort of a sidebar, he, he knew it was too expensive, both politically and financially. The American-made Stinger anti-aircraft missile is credited with turning the tide of battle. Armed with the Stinger, the Mujahideen neutralized Soviet air power. At first, the U.S. Army did not want to give them Stingers for fear of losing one of its state-of-the-art weapons to the Soviets. But then one of history's little ironies intervened. Word that a Soviet spy in Greece had already gotten his hands on the technology. If it hadn't been for that story, maybe we couldn't have uh, gotten the consent of the army to give the stingers to the Mujahideen. So actually you have a uh, spy having spied against us, helping the course of history. The stinger was more than just a weapon. Providing the Mujahideen with frontline American equipment was proof positive of U.S. commitment to the rebel cause. The Soviets must have come to a judgment that if we provided them with the stingers, there were a lot of other things that we could do that we hadn't done and that now we probably would do. U.S. support for the rebels totaled hundreds of millions of dollars, one of the largest covert operations ever run by the CIA. So large, it could not be kept secret. But this was one covert operation that could stand public scrutiny. One more reason the Soviets were forced to cut their losses. David Martin, CBS News, the Pentagon.